Hello and welcome to the third interview of the Doylestown Democrat Vote Local Interview Series. I am Connor O'Hanlon, the chairman of the Doylestown Democrats, and today I am joined by the two Democratic County Commissioners of Bucks County, Diane Marseglia and Bob Harvey. We're going to dive right into this today, and I'm going to ask you guys, what are the main functions of the County Commissioners? First of all, Good afternoon, and how great did that sound to hear the two Democratic commissioners <laughs> of Bucks County? I'm still not quite used to that yet. Um, so I guess I can start first with the um, obligations of a county commissioner. And it's funny because it's probably the question that we get asked most is what do county commissioners do? And we do a whole, we are in charge of, I guess, a budget of about $450 million. And there are around 640,000 people in Bucks County. So we're trying to make that budget make the, meet the needs of those people. We have a nursing home under us. The county jail comes under us. Children and youth, which is where anybody with abused or neglected children would call. And we have 200 social workers there. So it's a big, big program. The mental health department comes under us. Technically, drug and alcohol services come under us. Um, the Board of Election, which Bob was the chair last year. What else am I forgetting? You, now you go, tag team. So it's a lot of things that, it's a lot of, of parts of life that people don't even think about. You know, there's a park and rec system in this county uh, that we oversee. There are over 100 bridges that the county has possession of. You know, a few of the covered type, which of course everyone kind of knows where they are, and that's part of the tourist attraction of Bucks, but also just the more uh, not so kind of uh, unique concrete and steel bridges uh, that the county has control over. Um, I always point out the things that people never think about, which is that the county health department inspects every single restaurant in Bucks County. Uh, so when you go into a restaurant, you see you know, a health department you know, uh, certification up there. That's the Bucks County Board of Health that does that. Um, the Consumer Protection and Weights and Measures, uh, they actually go out and inspect every single gas pump and every single scale uh, in the county. So every, every time you go to the supermarket and buy lunch meat, anytime you go, um, you know, buy, you know, buy vegetables or whatever it is, when you, when you put it on a scale, that is measured, every gas pump's measured and certified by uh, uh, weights and measures every year. And so that's things that people never think of, that that falls under us. We um, also have a planning commission under us and community and housing development, which is pretty big because we are trying to deal with housing issues and the lack of affordable housing in Bucks County. So that falls under us. Could you expand on what the Planning Commission is for people? I know that, that it sounds like it's pretty obvious, but I think because it's so important, could one, could one of you guys expand on that a little bit? I served, uh, before I became a commissioner, I was on um, the Falls Township Board of Supervisors for 16 years. And before that, I was uh, on the Falls Township Planning Commission. And so the job of a, of a local township uh, or borough planning commission is really a different in some ways than what the county one is. The County Planning Commission does review plans for developments that are gonna come in, residential, commercial, industrial, et cetera. Uh, but the Planning Commission also is in, in some ways sort of the engineering part of the county government. So when they're looking at bridges that need to be repaired and they're putting together the bid specs and doing the work to, with our general services to figure out how do we get this done, they're looking for funding. Uh, trails that are done. There's an upper Bucks trail that just we cut the ribbon on, I guess, about a month and a half ago. Um, and there's a, other trails we're looking to build. That goes through the Planning Commission. Uh, they're looking at things, really planning for the future. So when we talk about affordable housing, when we talk about the need for uh, services that people might uh, be looking for, and maybe we're not advertising those as well, maybe there are things we're missing, uh, the Planning Commission would do surveys uh, to Bucks County residents to find out what is it that you like about Bucks County, what are some things that need to be improved on, and then they would help set up a comprehensive plan for the county. We just learned that there's a ton that goes into the county and planning and all this other stuff. So there's a lot of moving parts there, it looks like. So how big is the government? And we, you mentioned how, how big the budget is. And how do you work with the row officers? So that's another important thing I was thinking of, that we supply the court system with money to run the court system and the building and all the resources they need, as well as the budgets and the resources for the nine row officers. So um, that's, that's our primary purpose. They get to run their offices pretty independently, but they, they need to get their budget from us. I don't know if that's a good example of the check and balance in government. And obviously having you know, eight of the nine row offices are controlled by Democrats. Um, you know, the district attorney is the only Republican and his seat is up this year. So that's obviously going to be uh, a major focus of this election year. As in addition to four currently Democratic held 
Rose offices, which we took in 2017, that we really want to hold on to. Um, but now that we have this sort of the first time maybe ever <laughs> that this many Democrats have been elected at the county level, we really can look to do things collaboratively. When it comes to, you know, we're looking for ways to save money, looking for ways to save energy. Um, how do we uh, go paperless in this county? Uh, you know, and how do each of the row offices can put together ideas of how can they cut back on that? We're going to be launching a new website. Um, hopefully by June of this year, uh, we'll have a completely new website, which will be the first complete redesign of the website in 15 years. Uh, and certainly anybody who knows anything about technology and websites, to go 15 years and not change your website is just sort of, you know, you, you might as well just be using stone and chisels. Uh, but, um, but that kind of function, working with the row officers to say, what services can we put on the website that are going to help your office? What are the things that people need the most? What are the forms people need the most? Frequently asked questions. And so it's all a collaborative effort. Um, there are about 2,400, roughly 2,400 employees uh, in Bucks County. Everything from people who take care of the parks to, you know, judges, uh, you know, and, and their, you know, uh, assistants and, and all the people that work with them um, and all the rows and all their offices and prison and Board of Health and, and everything else. And obviously, we can see that there's a budgeting process that probably, ha I think it happens every single year for the county as well. Um, with all of these parts coming together, how do you how do you prioritize certain things in the budget? How do you come up with, you know, that's the number and that's what we're going to go with? I think part of it is that there are certain things we're required to do by mm -hmm. the state and federal government, so we can't really change that. And also, a lot of the things we have to do, we get to do, are reimbursed from the state and federal government. So that's kind of a, that's the easy part, because we're going to get reimbursed. And then, you know, I like to think that we should be looking at more how things are working and can they work better and then start to budget from there. Honestly, Bob and I have been doing a budget for a year and there was a pandemic, so. <laughs> Having worked in local government and I was a public school teacher for 26 years, and so I had to make budgets for my own department. Um, the system is, is pretty much the same as what's in Doylestown Township or Doylestown Borough. Uh, over the summer, you have each of the department heads who's told this is how much money is going to be allotted for your department or agency put together a budget um, and they submit something and of course they always ask for more than what they're being told they're allowed and it's up to our finance department to really kind of go through and start cutting and at some point though the, it'll get to our level a lot of times we've had they have an idea ahead of time we're really focusing on um, making changes with how we handle technology you know for example and one of the things we had a transition team, which we formed right after we were elected, of about 70 volunteers. A lot of people in Doylestown uh, uh, helped with that, including elected officials um, here in the borough and, and township. And one of the recommendations, for example, was we've got way too many desktop printers. Everybody likes to have their own desktop printer. Um, and that costs, obviously, electricity, it's ink, it's replacing parts, it's, it's you know, all that kind of thing. Uh, so how do we transition out of that? You know, how do we get to people that are saying, well, we're going to need 15 desktop printers next year? Mm, no, <laughs> no. How about we look at something else? How about we look at just one large copier that also serves as a printer for your floor? You know, uh, and that way it's much more efficient in that sense. So those kinds of messages are sent. Uh, but as, as Diane said, it, in some ways it's like a school board where schools have to do certain functions. And I've had conversations with school board members. I know that's going to want to be one of your future interview sessions. Um, people running for school board, they think, oh, I want to cut this and cut that and do this. And I, guess the, I always say, you know, there's a lot of things in that budget you can't touch. You know, it's state requirement, federal requirement. Salaries and benefits are sort of locked in by contracts. So the amount of the budget you have to control obviously is very small. And then obviously we're dealing with a nice present that the Republicans left us, which is a $7.5 million hole in our budget. <laughs> that they never bothered to fill uh, and left it for us to have to deal with. Um, so we've been managing that pretty pretty smoothly, but we're trying to figure out how to make that whole go away without having to raise taxes. This is the first time we've had control of the commissioner's board in, what, 38 years, I think it was? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, tell me about what has changed. I mean, you talked about the budget. and. Mm -hmm. Coming into coming into this, I mean, Diane, you've been on you've been on the uh, commissioner's um, board for a, for a little while now, but having control now, what has changed, and what have been some of the challenges 
from that change. Diane obviously was a commissioner for 12 years as the minority commissioner mm -hmm. and, and you know was sort of kept butting her head up against the wall trying to get things done and um, and, and did get many things done just through her own abilities. But um, I think she's better talking about what's changed. You can have an idea and people don't say no and just shut it down. <laughs> they say things like, oh, how could we do that? And, and so that's really, it's very exciting to have that happen. And it goes to prove that I used to think maybe I just have bad ideas and that's why the Republicans didn't take them. But now I'm realizing it's not necessarily that. It's because they weren't engaged. They didn't have the same interests. So now, I mean, I think we can come up with an idea, something we want to do, and we can find a way to, whether it's, it's not always money. Sometimes mm -hmm. it's just getting the players to look at something a different way. Yeah, I mean, in our previous interview with the supervisors, we had discussed this as well, where it's, it's something about values too. And, and certain values don't necessarily mean the bottom line, but it does, it, you can focus on the environment or you can focus on, you know, inclusion and diversity or whatever. And it just, it takes that next step. Now we can go back to COVID, which obviously is a unique, um, you know, it's a timepiece of where we are at right now. But, you know, Bob, this is your first year on the, on the as a commissioner, and you are thrown into a global pandemic. So can you guys talk about a little bit the challenges and the what you've learned maybe going through the, a global pandemic like this and how uh, government can, you know, function and help people? I, you know, one of the things we kept, it became sort of a, a standard line whenever we got emails, people asking about COVID and, and this and that. And a lot of emails we got were uh, from people, especially in the springtime, last spring when the governor was you know, shutting down businesses, it was, you know, Wolf's a dictator and we should just ignore him and, and um, you know, that kind of, you know, ridiculousness. But I kept telling people, there's nobody on the planet anywhere who's ever had to govern at any level through this kind of pandemic. So, you know, everybody is trying to figure out what's going to work and what's not going to work. Uh, and in many cases, you know, we, we certainly we've, uh, at every level, you've had you know, early on, you know, did masks work, did they not work? And there was some, you know, and obviously we figured that out. And, you know, there was some dispute in early on in the pandemic about, because it is so new, this is a new virus, um, could it be passed from people who weren't symptomatic or, or it could, it, we didn't know. Uh, and as you learn more, that's really been the biggest challenge is you're sort of fighting. It's almost like you're, you're blindfolded and, and, you know, and you don't know exactly where the opponent is, but you know, he's hitting you <laughs> or she's hitting you either <laughs> one. Um, and so you're, you're trying to swing sort of in the dark. Uh, and as you learn more, you start to realize, okay, here's how we focus. And this is not just us. This is literally the entire country and the world. We had regular calls really since this started, uh, very regular communication with all the counties around us, uh, Southeast PA, I should say, Monco, Delco, Chester, Philly, um, three times a week now. For a while, it was seven days a week uh, in the springtime. Um, and everybody, all of us are going through the same thing. You know, the county commissioners and council people and those other areas that, you know, Philly government, all just getting together, talking, asking each other, how are you handling this? How are you handling that? That's really been, you know, I think a silver lining. Um, you know, and, and it's part of the challenge, I think, and, and, and this falls sort of to Diane's been sort of the leader in this. You know, I'm obviously new to county government. Um, our other commissioner, the Rep lone Republican, Gene Girolamo, is also new to county government. He was a state representative. We have a new chief operating officer uh, who was a county employee and headed up a division, and she became the COO. So now we have these sort of all these new people in place having to deal with this enormous problem. Uh, and the only person who had the experience to be able to sort of like guide us through was Diane because she had been there so long. Um, and so it, that's one of the big challenges is, is figuring out we were just still getting our feet wet in terms of learning the job, and then this happens. Uh, and again, it's not like, you know, the, the county does have a pandemic guidebook, uh, which we're using now in terms of, uh, we've been using all year, really, but it, it doesn't necessarily cover anything of this scale. Um, and when you've got state involved, federal involved, it's uh, it's it's been a lot. Like you said, state and, uh, and federal involvement, but... Uh... We are obviously living in a very tumultuous time, and we're going to be living in that for a long time. Uh, I guess, have you seen some challenges in 
vaccine distribution, um, how much of the vaccine distribution falls on the county, um, how much of it is just a, a matter of we need to wait for the federal government. And, you know, maybe you guys can expand on that a little bit more in vaccine and maybe some of the uh, PPP and all that stuff that came out from the CARES Act and maybe we'll be getting some more stimulus mm -hmm. in the future. But all of that, I guess. I know that's, again, that's another... <laughs> You could do a lecture series probably just on that, but. This way I wanted to just try to address that is, you know, one of the good things, another silver lining was, because we were all sort of new, I was new at being, at being the chair and being yeah. a majority too, was that we had no, no preconceptions of how it was supposed to be. We weren't gonna do that, this is how we always did it. So we were able to be a little creative, which is really what you need when it's a new situation. But we did get that amount of money from the federal government that we were allowed to use. And we've been able to make some things in the county, people who were suffering, make it a little bit better. So we were able to use that money in a positive way. What we lacked was any kind of guidance from the federal government. And that's the same thing with a vaccine. And, and at the same time, what I've found is, be, especially because people are home so much, they're reading a lot, they're a lot on the internet, they're watching news channels all the time, and they're getting information that isn't always accurate to what the r real life is. You know, people watch and they see the vaccines in Florida and people are in these long lines and they want to get in the same line in Pennsylvania, but that's not how our government is distributing them. So it's all very different and what people hear from one state may not be in the next state. And I think sometimes when they write or call us, they're kind of frustrated and upset because they don't understand why it looks like that on TV and it's not here. As I alluded to earlier, the other massive challenge that we had, or you guys had, I should say, but we're all involved in it, was the election this past year in 2020 and Pennsylvania having a new law for mail-in ballots. Mm -hmm. But the since the counties are in charge basically of that, um, could you tell me a little bit uh, about that process and what it was like kind of just being, you know, I guess it's trial by fire at that point, but that yeah. Fire. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> but uh, just a little bit more about the mail-in ballot process. Uh, obviously, these are going to be something that continue in the future, but so something that you learned this year and can be carried forward for the for future elections. Bob should answer this as because he was chair, but also because... Uh, I mean, you came in as a new commissioner and were handed the Board of Elections and all of oh, this. Man. And, yeah, um, <clears throat> you know, it's, there were a lot of challenges, as you said. <clears throat> the one that people forget about was the fact that the county also last year rolled out brand new voting machines. And the Board of Elections, even before I took office uh, and before last January, the Board of Elections staff had already put together a really comprehensive well thought out, well planned schedule of public demonstrations of these machines. They knew where they were going all over the county, set dates, they had everything ready to go, Time, everything was uh, documentation, you know, paperwork ready to give out to people, samples, and it was, and I, they had about three or four of those. And I went to them and they were really, really very well done because uh, everyone was very, very nervous about these new machines, how do they work, et cetera. But uh, they only got about three or four of them because everything else shut down. Mm -hmm. So now we have to educate, in a presidential election year, we have to educate people about these brand new voting machines and how they work, and this is how you vote now, um, by video. Which, you know, the videos were, were good, but you know, they're obviously not as effective. Um, we also had to then explain to them Act 77, which was the new voting law, and we're learning it ourselves as it was sort of rolling out. There was a lot of the, the newness of it, of course, caused a tremendous amount of confusion. Um, and there was a lot of information coming out from, from, from you know, well-meaning organizations that were giving information to people, sending it out, mailing it out, uh, that was causing a lot of confusion. Uh, and there's nothing we could do about that. You know, there was some organization out of Virginia, I think it was, that kept mailing absent, ma mailing applications to people. I think I, we got like four sets of them at my house. There's four voters in my house. And I kept getting them over and over and over again. And they had a return envelope. To, you could put it in for, that was our address, county address. And we started getting all these complaints from people. Why is the county wasting this money sending out applications? Well, it's not us. We didn't send them out. Right. We didn't ask for them to be sent out. They just sent them out thinking this was being helpful. And it wasn't, it wasn't right. necessarily being helpful. Um, what really kind of, the thing that really did also overlay all of this was the fact that we knew we're in a swing state but we are a swing county in that swing state. 
we're the biggest county that you could argue is up for grabs. You know, Philadelphia, Allegheny, Monco, everybody knew how they were going in this election. Um, but, you know, we were more of a wild card. And that brought a lot of attention to us, you know, international attention and national media attention. But we also were very cognizant early, early on that it was also going to make us a lightning rod if anything went wrong. And so we had to dot every I, cross every T, to make sure that everything we did could withstand a legal challenge, which we knew we were going to get. Uh, and we were sued many times over how we conducted the election. Um, Jessica Vanderkam uh, uh, was the person who led that fight. She won every court case uh, in terms of, uh, which is a testament to her, but also the way our staff had handled themselves that, you know, the, you know it was... Trump zero, and I forget what our total was, but we, uh, you know, we, wow. we won. Yeah, we won every case. Um, but that was something else that every decision we made, we had to think about: how could this be turned on us? You know, if the election goes a certain way, and how do we prevent that from happening while still protecting people's right to vote, making it easy to vote, following the law? So, I mean, that's a great testament to like the strength of local government, especially the county government. Uh, just to to have that, you have that the test of being all these lawsuits and everything thrown at you at once, and it still like withholds that. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it is a testament to just the strength of the integrity of our elections. Um, the Moving forward from there, one thing that you know I find personally interesting, or uh, I don't know, I guess maybe not interesting is not the right word, but a challenge is young people in, in Bucks County. Um, obviously I'm, I'm young, I'm 24. So finding housing, finding, um, affordable housing and, uh, college and, you know, the list goes on of, of, for young people. Um, this is kind of a, this two part question. How do you attract young people to, to Bucks County and how do we get them to stay? <laughs> we need to give them a house so they can stay or an affordable apartment. That, that is certainly one of the biggest challenges we face. So, and so many people leave Bucks County. They go to work in Philadelphia or Montgomery County. So providing people with a job that pays a wage that they can buy a house for here is, is critical. Um, we have not had a lot of ability to work on that this year because of the pandemic, but that is, that's a huge, huge thing. One of the goals we came in, again, something that came out of the transition report, was the county has several different economic development agencies that handle different things. But, uh, and I kind of saw this as a township supervisor in the falls, that, that you almost didn't know who they were and what's the interaction between these two and, and you know, is, is this one, are they playing nice, <laughs> you know, with each other? Are they working on the same kind of goal or are they just sort of doing their own thing? And so um, we wanted to, to come in and change how that functioned. And we've started that process. We brought the uh, workforce development program into the county. Uh, that is something that helps train people for jobs. It helps connect employers with people looking for jobs. So it doesn't have to be someone who's looking for work. It could be an employer who's saying, gee, I need people to fill this kind of role. And then they make those connections. It helps with job training. Um, and so bringing them in and, and starting the process of having these agencies work more collaboratively, which we think is going to benefit employers in terms of attract and getting finding workers but also people looking for work and also helped make us more attractive for businesses to come here and set up shop um, and provide those jobs but the housing is key uh, you know when we, certainly we've there's been a lot of housing development obviously over the past couple of decades uh, Doyle's town townships population has changed dramatically over the past 30 40 years as a lot of Bucks County has uh, but how do we incorporate um, you know housing there for people like yourself you know, who are coming in, you know, young professionals and, and people, you know, who are starting out um, making, you know, a, a good salary, uh, but just can't find anywhere, you know, that, that's affordable for them. And there's another uh, aspect that it doesn't necessarily just hit at young people, but I know uh, disproportionately uh, people that have been affected by it in my age is the op opioid uh, epidemic. Um, how is Bucks County addressing that? Uh, I know that's something that we haven't really hit on today, but it is something that is a major issue for the county. And you know, I've, I know people that have died from, from opioid usage um, that are my age. So how is the county addressing that? To start with, we, we, our Drug and Alcohol Commission has a big hand in that. They give out Narcan, so anybody who want, wants to have Narcan should have it. We have saved 
many people's lives, just people driving and seeing something, you know, and they stop and they've got this Narcan. I keep it in my glove compartment and in my pocketbook all the time. Could you could you just briefly explain what that is? Sure, I, sure. I know, what, I know what that is, but for a lot of people, like I, that was a recent thing that I had learned about. Could you just explain on? So it's a, Narcan is something that you just put a simple spray up the nostril of anybody who has passed out that you, if they did not pass out because of something related to opiates, nothing would happen. But if it did, it can bring them back. And that allows you time to get an ambulance to come and whatnot. Um, but just follow that up. The, the county has also started a program now where when that happens, we follow up with some of the peer who has made it through recovery to go to the hospital to meet people who have overdosed so that they have someone who can help them walk through the process of getting treatment. Um, we are trying to make sure that there's no wrong door and that everybody is getting treatment. Obamacare has really helped people to be able to have access to the insurance for treatment, but the county sometimes has to pick up those first few days or weeks before Obamacare kind of stuff, you know, kicks in. Um, so, so we're doing all of that. Right before Bob got here, you know, I was able to start a drug and alcohol program in our jail, which we never had. But even right now, it's been limited to 50 men and 20 women. So, you know, once the pandemic is over and we are having more of a normal experience in the prison, we'll be able to go back to giving, you know, more assistance with substance abuse. This is something, I mean, the county deals, if it wasn't for the pandemic, it's one of the high priorities that the county has. Diane has, of course, been working this for a long time. And, and I you know, should also point out, uh, you know, that the Republican commissioner, uh, Commissioner DiGiralamo, um, his family has been affected uh, by, you know, by, by uh, drug abuse uh, issues. And so he's very, very, very much a proponent of, doing, of re really sort of, you know, the three of us are really in lockstep on that. Uh, so that's been great. Um, but we also have joined in a um, class action lawsuit against opioid manufacturers as a county, uh, looking to make sure that they pay for the damage that they've done uh, you know, to our community and communities across the country. Yeah, and uh, the, this kind of dovetails nicely with the, uh, the previous two interviews in which we talk about unification and maybe, maybe now is not exactly the greatest time for unification. We've had all this this turmoil, but uh, issues like the opioid epidemic really do ha see no party, no, like I said, it, it affects young people, it affects old people, it affects everyone in between. Um, so that's, I, I'm, that was a great, great um, illustrative answer for, for our viewers because the opioid epidemic, like you said, is mm -hmm. something that would be the top question if it wasn't for all of the crazy stuff that's happened in the last year. It's, touched, it's virtually touched everybody. We yeah. have grandparents raising children, grandchildren. Um, in the beginning of this opioid thing, everybody thought, oh, it won't happen in my neighborhood. It's happened in everyone's neighborhood. This is a question that I ask everybody, but uh, this is the Vote Local interview series. So we've obviously learned a lot about the Bucks County government, but what is, you know, the, what is the next uh, best reason other than just say like, you know, you can get great elected people like you. Um, what, what is the most important reason to vote local and get involved locally? This is where everything happens, right? <laughs> yeah. You know, I think we talk about, and, and you know, there are, there are multiple levels to this, as you said, you know, certainly you want your elected officials to do everything in their power to make their communities better. Uh, and that's kind of what I was raised very much in a, in a family that believed that. I got involved very early because I just saw aunts and uncles and my mom and dad that were very involved in things because, not for political reasons necessarily, but just because they wanted to make things better, whether it was community, school, whatever it was. Um, and one of the, I guess, the philosophical change that we've seen, and I know you're going to sort of ask this question later on about Democrats in office, but philosophically, we as Democrats believe that your county government should be actively serving you. Uh, and so many, we heard this from the people who were elected in 2017, the Democrats who took office, um, that they kept hearing, well, that's not the way we do things here. Because for so long, for 30 years, for you know, the majority of the history of this county, Republican Party controlled things. And if it wasn't broke, they didn't fix it. And even if it was broke, they didn't fix it. <laughs> you know, it just kind of let, you know, let things go, let things go, and, you know, whatever. Uh, and we came in and thinking, no, 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 there are areas where we need to be actively involved. And so in Doylestown Borough, which of course, you know, is, you know they've obviously changed things over the past uh, couple decades and, and things have been, you know, far different than they were. But in the township, is Doylestown Township or any other borough or township, 
is your government really doing everything they could do? Uh, and I think Democrats instinctively want government to be active. They see government as us. Uh, you know, we're servants of the people you know, who elected us. And if people didn't elect us, we're servants of them too. We should be actively trying to help them. So I think that's a, that's a big philosophical change. You know, it is, and we, that's kind of the big thing that's happened in the county level. I think it, you know, we're, people have noticed that early on. We came in and started saying, all right, we're going to do this, 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 this. And they're like, oh, well, we don't usually do those things. Don't care. I'm doing them now. <laughs> you, know? you know, one of the things that we've been able to accomplish recently goes to show how important voting for people in a local office is. We have started a new program in Ben Salem where there are co-responders. They're basically social workers who are going out with the police on calls that really need social workers, not a police. Could be somebody having a mental illness and they're having kind of a, a rough time. It could be an aging parent who, who is struggling. They're keeping, they keep calling the police because they need help, but they really need a social worker. So, you know, we've gone ahead and said, all right, let's try it. Let's, you know, there's pilot money out there. We're willing to do it. Let's find a police department who will try it. We'd now like to expand it to other police departments. That's why voting local is so important because we can actually do stuff that'll change it. You know, we need to have a mental health court in this county, and that's something we're hoping to accomplish this year. People with mental illness should not end up in jail because there's nowhere else for them to go. We get to actually work on that. So you want to vote for people who are going to make the concrete changes in your community that you can see. Well, I mean, those are both great answers. And, and it does say why, you know, having a Democrat in, in your position is important as well, because we do have certain values that put forth solutions to certain issues in a certain way. Um, my last question for you guys is, uh, if people want to get involved more, and you know, obviously voting is what we ask them from this interview series, but if they want to get involved more with the county, whether that be through the government or through another vehicle, what, what should they do? So there's boards and commissions that we have that we make appointments to. You can go right on the website and there's a form there. It's a very simple application. See what you're interested in. That, that can be very helpful. And, and I would also add, just again, coming from the election side of things, one of the things we did notice was an issue in this past election. Um, and COVID probably played a small role in this, not as big a role as it played in the spring, but probably a small one. People working in the polls on election day, you know, the actual poll workers themselves, you know, the judges of elections, the machine operators, the inspectors, the clerks. Um, we saw, you know, in many cases, the people that, we, that were working, you know, we could be working very, very hard, but especially with new machinery, they may not have been as adept at working with it. Um, you know, we need people who are there, in, you know, twice a year, basically, uh, to help those elections run smoothly. I think we know that some of the lines that we saw on election day were simply because a lot of people showed up to vote. But some of the lines were also because, because the people inside, you know, weren't working maybe as efficiently as they needed to. Um, and, that, and so we're, we are going to be looking actively and asking, you know, all the political parties, really, even both parties, but especially, in, obviously, on our side, um, start asking for people that want to work that day. You get paid. It is obviously a long day. Um, the good news is 2021, you know, you're going to have a smaller turnout of people. It shouldn't have the same sort of level of vitriol that we saw last year, we hope, uh, because it's local elections. Not that they're not important, but... You know, we need people to work inside the polls as well. So that's something that you could do um, in addition to looking for boards. And, and even the boards and, and uh, commissions, they're obviously Doylestown Borough has those, Doylestown Township has those, and they're usually looking for people to serve on those. So there's a lot of things you can do to get involved. Well, thank you guys both for your great answers for this, uh, for this interview. And it's very, very enlightening to see all these answers. And you can also find uh, the county meetings on your website and on Facebook, correct? Yep. Yes, yep. and that's new to us. That didn't happen before um, we were the majority in Bucks County, so. Yeah, so for those watching, if you guys would like to watch the county government meetings live, you can definitely do so, and they'll be on Facebook, which is awesome. That's how I watch them. But um, thank you guys once again for joining us today, and um, for those watching, if you want to sign up for our Zoom live uh Doylestown Democrats Vote Local interview series where you can do Q&As and et cetera. Go to the, the description link down below to the Doylestown Democrats website. You can sign up for any future uh, 
interview series. And if you wanna go check out the past interviews, you can go right on our YouTube channel and you can find all of the previous interviews uh, right there. So thank you again, Diane, Bob, and thank you to Koru Real Wellness for hosting us today and, ho and helping us shoot this. So thank you very much. And if you feel so inclined and you wanna support the Vote Local interview series, please go and give us a donation to make this all this possible where we get to rent out this space and get our county officials here and get everybody in here and uh, shoot something that will actually help educate people about local government. So thank you again, and I hope to see you at our next Zoom interview.